Welcome to Beyond Wall Street, presented by Arixa Capital, where expert investors make their unique investment strategies easy to understand. I'm your host, Jan Bresky, and today I'm talking with Harlan Cherniak of The Forest Road Company. We'll be talking about financing films as a credit investment strategy. Today I'm here with Harlan Cherniak. Thank you so much for joining us for today's interview. Thank you, Jan. I appreciate you spending the time with me. I've enjoyed our previous conversations, and I'm really looking forward to digging into that. As am I. So, Harlan, your firm is in, active in the specialty finance area, and let's just jump into an example of a film finance that you would do and walk us through what, what is the investment that you're making in a film project? How does it work? As you may or may not be aware, the independent feature film market is enormous. And we like to think about how we frame each of the various markets that we invest. The Forest Road Company was founded about five years ago by my two partners, Zachary Tarika and Idan Shani. And the three of us are longstanding principal credit investors. And the market that we're operating in largely has one key common theme, and that's tax credits. We think the market's about a $6 billion market. And when you look at it, either across each individual state that has a film tax incentive program, or you look at the number of submissions to each of the film festivals in the US, we can triangulate around a market that's really big, highly inefficient, and rather underpenetrated. And what we do is we democratize access to capital for those that are creating content by providing them with more efficient, more access to capital to finance their films. So if you and I made a film in New York City about ice skating in Rockefeller Center around the Christmas tree in you know, the, between Thanksgiving and Christmas, let's say the average film budget's about $2 million. That includes both above the line and below the line expenditures above the line being the cast, the crew, the directors, below the line being the film, the lighting, et cetera. In a state like New York, the New York State Film Tax Commission or these departments of economic development offer incentives to create jobs, to attract tourism, and to invest in the infrastructure in local economies. So in that example of our $2 million film budget, Let's just say for argument's sakes that $1 million of the budget qualified as New York State qualified expenditures. We will be issued a rebate at 30 cents on the dollar for that $1 million budget. And that is the primary source of collateral for the loans that we're underwriting at Forest Road. So sure. let's take your example. It's a $2 million film budget and there's a million of that is qualified for these state tax credits. And there's a 30% or maybe, I guess, a $300,000 rebate available. So what is the actual investment that you make? Is it putting up that 300,000 or is it putting up the million and getting back? How does it work? Walk us through the, the numbers on that example. So part one is they will typically gather equity financing from whether it's friends and family or some institutional capital. But what Forest Road is lending against is that $300,000 future New York State tax credit. So we're effectively factoring or using that collateral as the V in our loan to value calculus. And we're often extending 70% loans on an LTV basis against that tax credit. Or that okay. Rebate. Okay. So on the $300,000 tax credit, you maybe lend them $210,000. And they can use that as part of their budget to get the project moving. And your source of repayment is when they collect that tax credit, you get your 210000 back plus, I guess, interest at that point? Exactly. So these tax credits are one component of our lending strategy in film finance. The second piece, which is even more attractive and even larger at the moment, just as you might imagine, with theatrical exhibition, there has been an absolute war for content. Sony, Disney, 
Netflix, Amazon have committed to spending hundreds of billions of dollars for content. And Forest Road is also lending against those streams of cash from Netflix, Amazon, Hulu, et cetera. And when you think about in the context of those film budgets, the two largest sources of collateral are these minimum guarantees or these cash flows from the streamers or the SVOD platforms. Okay, so I think this is gonna be really interesting to our audience because you're taking an industry that most people think of as high risk, kind of um, swinging for the fence, but you're actually creating a more of a credit, private credit investment. And you're saying it's it's um, backed by an investment grade credit most of the time. So so let's get into the how you build a portfolio. What is your um, what is your typical investment amount? What's the range, smallest to largest, in the portfolio that you're building right now? Yeah. So what's what's really unique about what we do is we really refer to it as our flywheel. In the production of a film, there's an enormous amount of accounting tax work and groundwork that needs to be laid. And we use those services as a key way to, to both source, originate, and more importantly, to tether our relationships with the developers of content and the studios over the course of the firm's history. And when you think about that, it's really important because that's what drives the repeat borrower relationship. If you think about Forest Road and you think about Forest Road's affiliates, over the last five years, we've extended close to 200 loans. And the evolution of our portfolio and the development of our portfolio construction and the return profile is actually, in my view, some of the most attractive risk-adjusted returns that I've ever seen. And by that, I think about it in, in a few ways. We have a 0% loss given default. We've never lost money on a loan. And you think about why is that? The answer is because our credit counterparty risk are investment grade counterparties. We are underwriting these loans to an incredibly prudent loan to value. We often have power of attorney directly over the entities that receive the tax credits or the cash flows from Netflix or from the state of New York or Georgia, Louisiana, New Mexico, et cetera. Mm -hmm. We often have these collection account management agreements that specifically designate how the cash moves through the waterfall and through the system. And because our diligence is incredibly rigorous, where we have a specific due diligence checklist that includes everything from the bank audits, the opinion letters, the certificates that are needed, it's almost as if we underwrite these credits to the same standards that you might see at an investment bank or a large alternative asset manager. And it's highly uniform across each of the borrowers, but because each of the programs in each of the 30 plus or minus states that we underwrite in, they're all different. It's highly esoteric. And we remove that burden off of the borrower's plate and we make their lives easy. Since we've built this business, yep. the, L the loan to value has stayed incredibly constant. Is that around 70 on both? Because you mentioned 70% on the tax credit side. Do you also try to lend about 70% of the guaranteed payment when you're on the streaming guarantees as well? Or do you have a different loan to value there? The LTV on average across our entire portfolio is about 70%. Okay. And in fact, it's remained relatively constant. So as the market has grown and as, there's, as we've started to see some competition and the barriers to entry or the moat from a competitive standpoint has changed a little bit. We haven't changed our underwriting standards and we haven't sacrificed the quality of the okay. credits that we're extending. So um, among the loans that you've done in the last year or so, what's the range in size that most of the loans fall in smallest and largest where your investment dollar amount, is it one to 5 million or something other than that? Yeah, the, the average loan, over the last 12 months is in the one to $5 million context. Okay. And um, what are the states that you've made the largest dollar volume of loans in? The states that we are most active in are the states where there is one, the largest programs with respect to film tax incentives and where there's sound stage capacity. 
So the three largest markets that have the most attractive tax credit programs are California, Georgia, New York. Okay, great. And what is the target return for each investment? I'm not talking about the return that the investors in your funds or vehicles or your company would get because that's not what this program is about, um, as you and I have talked about before. This is about the the gross return of the investment that you're targeting because uh, how do you price the loan? So let's say I'm making a movie and I want to borrow $2 million because I've got a, you know, I've got a tax credit here that you can lend against. So how would you price that investment to me as a borrower? And also what's the maturity of that investment? Sure. The vast majority of our loans have a one year maturity. We target gross teens from a cash on cash return perspective. And if I look at the portfolio of loans that have been repaid, just some high level, you know, snapshot return profile, 0% loss given default, 14.9% cash on cash return, 29.2% gross IRR. Now think about that for a second. These are unlevered returns where the average underlying credit risk is investment grade counterparties, some of which are non rated rated because certain states actually don't have technical general unsecured credit ratings, but they are effectively investment grade counterparty risk. So the spread that we're earning or the illiquidity premium that we earn on these loans on an unlevered basis is, in our opinion, really attractive risk. And the IRR is higher than the cash on cash return. Is that because there's an origination fee or is that because if it there's a guaranteed minimum interest and sometimes they pay off in less than a year. What, what is the source of that difference? It's a combination of factors. It's a combination of fees. It's a combination of duration. The average tenor of the loans that we have had repaid in our portfolio is less than one year. And the reason for that is we do not take principal photography risk. So we do not extend credit to our borrowers until they've completed the principal photography phase. The principal photography phase is generally comprised about 80% of the total budget. So that by the time Harlan and Jan have completed the principal photography phase, we don't have to worry about flight risk from a member or of our crew or of the cast. We don't have to concern ourselves with the unavailability of sound stage capacity or any risks of COVID-19 and quarantine. And we don't have to concern ourselves, at least within the forest road ecosystem, about the ability to complete the post-production editing because we have relationships where we can do that ourselves. Okay, so we're making a one-year investment. It's a kind of a 15% cash on cash return, interest rate, more or less. So, so it strikes me that this is a must be very hard to source these loans. How do you source the loans? And can you get enough of them to build up a meaningful size portfolio of them? Absolutely. Both really great questions. We have a team of experts that have relationships with all of the small and mid major studios, as well as all of the independent film producers who have had success both on single films, multiple pictures over the years. And as a result of that, we've really developed our own internal proprietary sourcing network. We have our own CRM, our client relationship management system. We have a dedicated team of experts who are able to assist independent film producers and the mid-major studios with the process of filing for and the certification process of these tax credits, which can be very cumbersome very labor intensive, and it allows the producer to focus on what they do best. So we are effectively removing a lot of the middle office, as well as the back office operational accounting, tax and advisory services. And at the same time, because we understand our process and it's repeatable, we're improving the quality of our underlying collateral to make sure that it's documented properly, to make sure that it's filed properly, and to ensure that we're gonna have timely payment of return. I see a lot of analogies uh, between the, our business and, and real estate lending. It's state by state, so you have to understand the laws in that state or help navigate that. And also you're, you're, you're serving a, a large market of smaller players. I'm assuming the biggest movie producers 
can get bank financing in many cases for this this layer of their capital stack. Is that is that right? And is it is there sort of a size at which you don't bother to to chase them because they're going to get financing at at five percent or less instead of fifteen, or or how does how does that work? It's really, it's a really interesting question, and it's evolving. It was changing pre-COVID, and I think the pace of disruption and the pace of evolution has accelerated post-COVID. And by that, I mean it's this transition of traditional consumption of content on screen to the digital formats that which we consume them today, and more importantly, the banks and the bank's behavior has changed over time because the media and entertainment industry has had a lot of similarities in terms of impairments on the balance sheet to oil and gas. And if you think about the traditional markets, California, Georgia, which I think the average that I've most recently heard was that California has about 6 million square feet of sound stage capacity. So of course, the large studios, Universal, Sony, Disney uh, are able to access either their own balance sheet financing or they can access capital from JP Morgan. But a lot of the independent film producers or some of the smaller studios don't have the same credit score, they don't have the same credit quality, and they don't have the same access. Plus, a lot of the banks have exited the market, and you're seeing an incredibly fragmented opportunity set. It's very similar to the transition of traditional credit from a bank to the private credit or the direct lending unit. Right, and which is a theme we've been exploring on this, on this interview series across all kinds of asset classes, uh, whether that's real estate loans, loans secured by fine art, you know, loans, consumer loans for people to get um, their orthodontics done, things like that. So this is a really interesting niche. So for our audience of of investors that are looking to identify different private market opportunities, how would you advise? If investors find this to be a compelling niche, how could they go about researching it and getting some exposure to it? Are there ways for investors to participate or is it through private companies and that's the only way to to participate in these kinds of loans? Yeah, unlike other passive credit products or indexed credit products, there really is no market for this from a liquid standpoint. Obviously, we have our own pools of capital and some of our partnerships and funds that we have formed both dedicated to the strategy and those that are more opportunistic in nature because we see a ton of activity as a result of these tax credit plus minimum guarantee or streaming cash flow financing. But I I don't know of any other player in the market that has the same level of sophistication as to how we approach this. That would, that would satisfy both RIA, high net worth, or institutional underwriting in terms of the, the, the fiduciary duties or the steward of capital that I think we are, because we all came from stressed or opportunistic credit backgrounds. So we focus first and foremost on downside protection, and we truly try and create range or a expected value range of outcomes that allows us to truly capture the alpha in this market because it's highly inefficient. So let's talk about that downside for a minute. What would you say would be the number one risk that you're constantly guarding against that you worry about? What could cause a loss? You mentioned you have not had any principal loss so far in the 200 loans. What would be the the biggest risk areas that you think about and, and, and guard against? One is something that's probably prevalent in all markets, which is accounting fraud or counterparty risk. And the second are some of the unfortunate aspects of film production and gross negligence, as we most recently experienced or witnessed with the shooting on the set of Rust. Got it. I understand. So if something happens that interrupts a film like that, they may never get to being able to collect on the credit if they don't finish the film, presumably, right? Which is why we often rarely advance capital until they've completed principal photography. Oh, got it. Okay. So let's turn to your background for a minute. Can you give us a sort of a your career path and what brought you to this point? Absolutely. I've been in and around credit for almost 21 years. 
after graduating from college, I was an analyst in the Credit Suisse first Boston leverage finance practice just after the merger with DLJ. And that typically sets you up for an associate role at private equity. And while I was an associate in private equity, one of my portfolio companies had gone through restructuring and the light bulb had gone off about the intricacies and the complexities of balance sheet restructuring and chapter 11. And I was intrigued by its inefficiency. This was right in and around the time of Enron and WorldCom and all the accounting scandals and fraud. And I spent years really trying to hone that craft. And I worked at funds that were focused on investing in these special situations and ultimately landed on a team at KKR called the Special Situations Team, where we built and led a strategy across the US, Europe, and Asia. And last year, I was introduced to Zach again. He was a friend and a mentor of mine. Idan was actually an investor in one of my prior funds. And I was intrigued by what they were doing because it allowed me to explore the same skills of underwriting and investing and developing relationships but in an industry that was relatively new to me. And as a, as a lifelong learner and someone who appreciates the opportunity to, to learn something new. Give us one, one thing that you like about the niche that you specialize in, this niche of film finance. What, what's something about it that, uh, that you enjoy about the job? Number one, I love film. So it's an opportunity to continue to democratize access to capital for those who contribute to the world of creative content. And post COVID with the, the war for content and the transition to digital, whether it be through a video on demand, a transactional video on demand, an advertising based video on demand system, having an opportunity to further the development of the libraries of this content across all genre, across geographies, it's super exciting. And I think the next iteration of what we're doing and how we're going to continue to further the development of what we do is technology. Because whether it's the intersection of technological solutions to improve our underwriting, our portfolio management, or the introduction of something such as blockchain to help improve the monetization of that content and to ensure and protect the provenance of intellectual property and to mitigate both accounting or additional fraudulent activity in the space or piracy. I think that there's a number of opportunities for us at Forest Road to really tap into our toolkit, to leverage our relationship science and our web of contacts and truly develop a cutting edge, like leading product uh, in this world of specialty finance as we scale. Yeah, we've been hearing a lot about blockchain as a solution for creators and uh, and and it's it's not just for speculation on Bitcoin and Ethereum, but it could be used for people that own the rights to to the content they create. And, and it sounds like you're looking at that as a future um, investment space as well. Is that is that correct? I think that's right, Jan. I am highly confident that the creation of digital solutions, the adoption of technology and the use of digital tools, the ability to tie a non-fungible token with an experience, whether it be never before seen uncut components of the film, the ability to introduce a member of the cast to someone who is a lifelong fan of horror, comedy, drama, Al Pacino, Bruce Willis, you name it. I think that the, the world of media and entertainment is literally going to go through a revolution of its own. And I think it's this combination of content, technology, and all that we are seeing, whether it be in our own universe or perhaps even in the metaverse, which is yet just another extrapolation of technology in a way that to truly capitalize on. I can that. speak for, for my own family where certainly when we had COVID hit, we started watching shows that we had not watched before. In fact, while we, while our kids were younger, we didn't even have a TV for many years. And, and for sure, 
um, we've consumed more of that since COVID hit. So I want to come back and just summarize this, what we've covered for our, for our viewers and listeners. So we're talking about loans that are secured by payments from either a state in the United States or from a streamer. And you're around 70% loan to value. They're one to $5 million investments. You've done 200 loans, no losses to date, and you've got a double digit um, cash on cash return or interest rate that you've been able to achieve. And the, the IRRs are a bit higher than that because of some additional fees or, sh or loans that pay off early. So I think that's a wrap. That's a really valuable um, insight into a, a, a very niche space that would be hard for us to find out about any other way. So I just want to say thank you, Harlan, for, for explaining this and walking us through it today. I really appreciate it. I think your questions were very insightful. I've always enjoyed the conversation. And I think you hit the nail on the head that the macroeconomic trends in our industry, plus the mousetrap that we've developed to source, originate, execute, and deliver returns to our investors in this space is something that we're truly proud of. We're happy to get on the phone with you or any of your colleagues to dive deeper. I think given that each individual program is a market unto its own, it is very difficult to develop uh, this expertise. It is very difficult to replicate the network that we have both for potential borrowers and from an underwriting perspective. It's not a cookie cutter market. And I think it is something that will remain inefficient uh, for a long time, but we are exploring ways to make it better. I'm Jan Bresky, and you've been listening to Beyond Wall Street. 